Hello and welcome to the Money Marketing Podcast. I'm Kimberly Donder, Digital Content Manager. And in this week's Weekend Essay Podcast, we have features writer Amanda Newman-Smith explaining why office design appealing to the five senses makes sense. Take it away, Amanda. Join us at Money Marketing Interactive London on the 17th of October. Just go to the Money Marketing website to secure your seat at our industry leading event and hear from notable figures in the industry. See you there. During an interview for my first journalism job, I had to do a writing test. I'd been asked to write a few paragraphs about the office I was in, a small unit on an industrial estate in South London. As a football fan, sitting at a desk beneath a massive poster of former Newcastle and England footballer Alan Shearer gave me a way in and a connection with my future colleagues. I didn't know at the time that the news editor was a Geordie who, like many on Tyneside, prickled if anyone dared to question Shearer's godlike genius. But I could hazard a guess that someone in the office liked football, so I used my knowledge of the beautiful game to poke gentle fun at their personalisation of the office to break up the more mundane elements of my descriptive prose. I passed the test and gave the editor a chuckle at the same time. When I moved on from there and found myself sitting by a blank white wall in a bigger, more corporate office that seemed right for personalisation, putting a few football posters on the wall seemed reasonable. After all, most of my colleagues liked football and supported various teams. As well as my Spurs team photo, I'd put up a fixture list and posters of whichever players appeared in a Spurs magazine I used to buy. I never gave it much thought until one of the players left for another team and a workmate saw me tearing his picture off the wall. She wasn't a football fan and expressed disappointment as she'd thought this particular player was attractive. I told her I didn't want posters of players who weren't in my team, explaining how gutted I'd felt when Teddy Sheringham had left Spurs for Man United to win things. Throwing his poster in the bin had been cathartic, but my workmate didn't understand. To her, these were just pin-ups. Our conversation had made me look at my poster collection in a different light. I remember looking at all the other blank walls around me, thinking perhaps it wasn't as appropriate as I'd initially thought. Nobody else was customising the space around them, and although my manager hadn't said anything, I started thinking my posters were coming across as unprofessional, if viewed as pin-ups, not an image I wanted to project. We moved to another area of the office shortly after that, and having taken the posters down for the move, I never put any back up. Though clinical, the blank white walls seemed more appropriate. I'd forgotten all about this until I chatted to Sheena Doherty, Senior Wealth Management Consultant at St James's Place Partner Practice Sovereign Wealth, Halifax, for a feature on office design having an impact on wellbeing. Sheena and I had spoken a couple of times before about how she'd brought her team, who had been working from home since the pandemic, back into the office five days a week, with wellbeing at the heart of it. We'd talked about the well-being benefits of the new office, such as access to a gym, spa and exercise sessions. But what stuck in my mind this time was the attention to detail Sheena has paid to this, ensuring the office is almost a home from home for her team. My favourite innovation is Sheena's snack drawer, which is regularly stocked up with healthy snacks in case her team, or young children who accompany her clients in meetings, get peckish. I was also struck by the team's professional qualifications and degree certificates gracing the office walls, as Sheena wants to display their achievements rather than them languishing in a drawer at home. I'm no wellbeing expert, but considering how much time we spend at work, feeling at home in the office environment and knowing our employer values our achievements has got to have a positive impact on employees' mental health, productivity and staff retention. Knowing Sheena as I do, I didn't think beyond that's just Sheena showing she cares. But then I read an article about sense hacking by Susie Dawes, head of people and culture at CABA, a charity that works with chartered accountants. It showed me that all the things Sheena has introduced make great business sense as well. Sense hacking is a technique explored in a book by Oxford psychology professor Charles Spence, where the five core senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste and touch, are used to influence emotions and improve social and mental health. It involves using different sounds, smells, visuals, tastes and textures to help people relax or become more alert. Apparently this can help employees with things like reducing stress and improving sleep quality. Using this technique, Dawes lists five ways that people can use sense hacking in the office to promote well-being. 
it would take too long to go all through five of them, but three of them stood out for me because they tied in with the transformation Sheena had made to her office. One is the use of colour, whether that be calming blues or energising reds. By understanding how colours affect us emotionally, we can make conscious decisions about which colours will help us feel better mentally and physically, says Dawes. This doesn't have to be a big and bold feature wall. It can be more subtle, such as changing the desktop background on a computer or displaying a bunch of flowers in a particular colour to evoke a certain mood. Flowers can also tap into our sense of smell. As Dawes points out, studies from the Durrell Institute of Conservation and Ecology at the University of Kent found that the smell of nature can bring a feeling of serenity, happiness and wellness to people in the office. <laughs> Going back to Sheena's snack drawer, Dawes points out that healthy snacks provide essential vitamins and minerals to keep you energised and alert. But she adds that some nostalgic snacks can recall positive memories, perhaps from childhood, that can, quote, ease your mind away from negative thoughts and recenter. Until I started work on this feature, I hadn't realised how much of an impact our office environment can have on our well-being and productivity at work. This wasn't something employers paid much attention to when I started out in journalism. Back then, I'm sure it would have been dismissed as airy-fairy. <laughs> The focus tended to be on basic physical health, as long as you had a decent chair and you were aware of how to safely use a computer or where you went. None of my previous employers saw it as their responsibility to go that bit further and provide healthy breakfasts or snacks to staff. But reflecting on my first job, I think the editor was ahead of his time. In running a more informal office setup, he ensured his team felt comfortable enough to bring their authentic selves to work. Shorts could be worn in the office in the summer, so I heard every hairy leg joke going as my male colleagues playfully teased each other about showing their calves to the world. We could also bring music in to be played towards the end of the day. This is how I first heard the classic album Urban Hymns by The Verve. A colleague in advertising brought in his CD and played it to us as we were starting to wind down. I don't think it's any coincidence that team was a happy, tight and extremely hard working one. Now, well-being in the office is at another level, and I was totally ignorant of many of these trends. I've learned about the popularity of biophilic designs, where neutral colours and natural elements like wooden furniture and plants create a calming atmosphere that reduces stress and aggression. I was initially a bit sceptical at some of the things I was hearing, like wooden furniture bringing to mind a theme of being at one with nature, which can help lower stress levels. I have a lot of wooden furniture in my house. I got rid of our glass tables years ago when our youngest threw a placement onto the coffee table and smashed it to smithereens. And yes, it does add a different thing into a room. Writing about the link between office design and wellbeing has been an education. I've had window master chief executive Eric Boyter enlightening me about new building regulations around indoor air quality in offices. To meet these requirements, specifiers and fit-out professionals, professionals are turning to the latest HVAC, heating, ventilation and air conditioning technologies, particularly natural ventilation systems, which remove stale air from a room, replacing it with fresh air, needing little or no mechanical assistance, he told me. What was striking about topics like biophilic designs and air quality was how employee well-being is closely linked to a firm's culture and their stance on ESG. Practising what you preach is so important when it comes to ESG, so it was interesting when conversations around creating a peaceful environment with neutral colours and wooden furniture moved naturally onto topics like recycling old furniture in line with company values. Similarly, when you're talking about improving air quality in the office, it isn't long before you're talking about energy efficiency and carbon footprints. Sceptical me might have thought, if I'm starting a business, wouldn't I have enough to worry about and find the money for without looking at what the desk is made of and whether staff have an area to chat over a coffee? But I know the younger generations that are preparing to leave school now have been brought up with certain expectations around the importance of well-being and the environment due to the legacy of the pandemic. <laughs> What brought this home to me was attending the Rudolf Fulker Foundation's Interschool Drama Awards of my eldest last weekend. Walker is a highly respected black actor with over 60 years experience and is perhaps best known in recent years for playing Patrick Truman in EastEnders. He set up the foundation to help young people, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds, unlock their potential in the performing arts. 
At the awards, we watched seven 10-minute plays that were written and performed by secondary school students aged 11 to 18. The plays were all different. One was about a young gay man who wanted to be a fashion designer, coming out to the bigoted father who wanted him to be a footballer. Another was a comedy where the bad guy got sent to hell. But there were a few overarching themes, taking care of the environment, looking out for each other and having the courage to be yourself. These are ideas that young people are coming up with themselves, so they're clearly the things that matter to them. As future employees, I have no doubt that these youngsters will want to work for employers that can demonstrate that they share the same values. Just as I knew, I wanted to work with those football fans in that small office on that South London industrial estate all those years ago. Thanks, Amanda, for another amazing Weekend Essay podcast. We do hope that you enjoyed it. Please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you get your podcasts from. You can also keep up to date with all our new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as our print edition, Money Marketing Magazine. So make sure to subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time.